Good morning, everyone. Just wait for a few more people to come into the room. Great to see uh, so many people joining us. I think we've got quite a great uh, international audience. So yes, someone. Hi to Raphael in Toronto. Oh, good evening. So Lisa, we might get started because we do have an enormous program today. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the first of two sessions on peripheral centralities, politics, policy and practice. My name is Bronwyn Clark. I'm the CEO of the National Growth Areas Alliance and I'll be your MC today. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting you today on the lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of this land. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. It's wonderful to see uh, such a great audience today. We're gonna have some fantastic speakers as well. And, I see from our list, we've got many representatives of local, state and federal government across Australia, as well as a great range of um, people from academia right across the world. So welcome to you all. Thank you for either staying up late or getting up early, whatever your time zone is. Um, but we'd love to see in the chat um, where you are, are watching from. I'd also like to acknowledge that these two seminars today have been brought to life by two, um, two people. That's uh, Professor Nick Phelps, from, he's the Chair of Urban Planning at the University of Melbourne, and Associate Professor Paul McGinn from the University of Western Australia. Um, they're fantastic partners to have in for the National Growth Areas Alliance because they really um, are uh, really interested in working with practitioners on the ground who are trying to um, make great new towns and suburbs and cities in outer metropolitan areas. So the National Growth Areas Alliance, we're really pleased to partner with the University of Melbourne, the University of Western Australia, and also York University and the Urban Studies Foundation who are bringing this seminar series to life. For those not familiar with the National Growth Areas Alliance, you might wonder who we are and why we're interested. It's really because peripheral centralities are our core business. Uh, we represent local government in outer metropolitan areas across Australia's capital cities. They look a little bit like the, uh, the vision behind me, but they are also um, towns that have grown into cities and they are the paddocks that have grown into suburbs. Um, they are home to about 20% of Australia's population. So it's a really vast uh, section of our, of our population in Australia who live in, in these areas. So we're really interested in how outer metropolitan areas can become hubs, uh, cities, centres in their own right. And we'd love to see policy and politicians in particular look out towards our direction um, rather than perpetuating policies that require us to look into their direction. So before we kick off um, and I hand over to Nick for the first seminar, just a little bit of housekeeping. There will be a number of presentations happening and then we'll have time for substantial discussion afterwards. So we'd love to have your questions come through the chat box, through the chat function, and then we will sort of collate them and work them into the discussion after the panel session. So without further ado, thank you. And I'll hand over to Nick Phelps. Thanks, uh, Bronwyn, um, and uh, thank you very much um, to uh, the National Growth Areas Alliance for um, you know uh, joining in with us in this venture. Um, this is a series of um, four seminars that are funded um, through the Urban Studies Foundation, and uh, Paul McGinn and myself are hosting um, these two events. Uh, this is the second seminar in the, in the series of four, so there are two academic seminars, I guess, uh, and one more policy practice facing, which is this one. Um, and uh, a final one, which is to do with early career um, researchers. 
Um, so Bronwyn mentioned that we're interested in the theme of peripheral centralities. Um, I think broadly that means um, in non-academic terms that we're interested in placing uh, the outer suburbs in particular uh, more central in, in discourse, uh, discussions, um, and in particular thinking about the, the opportunities and the challenges that, that face, face us as we build out uh, metropolitan areas um, in the form of uh, outer suburban communities. Um, so that's the broad theme. And uh, today's um, seminar um, is really uh, policy focused, um, trying to sort of think of some of those challenges. And, and in particular, we've got the first session today, which is, I guess, themed around the idea of there being different vintages of suburbs with distinctly different opportunities, distinctly different planning uh, and policy challenges. Um, so um, as Bronwyn mentioned, uh, we've got a pretty tight schedule. Um, I'm probably gonna stop uh, sharing uh, my screen, I think, um, here, so we can uh, begin uh, to move on. Um, and I wanna turn to um, some of the, the speakers now, and the first speaker, um, Peter uh, Colaccino. Um, um, and uh, we've asked people to speak for about 10 minutes, pretty much the maximum, and to share their slides. And if you've got questions or comments, please do put those um, in uh, the uh, the comments um, uh, section there. Um, that will be um, the best way to to get questions and, and comments to us. Um, Paul and I will will field those and we'll collect them together at the end. And I think in the case of, um, of Peter in particular, um, uh, I think uh, he has to leave fairly quickly. So it would be good to get your comments and questions in there pretty quick before uh, he has to leave for some other important meetings. So I will, um, without further ado, hand over to, to Peter Colaccino, uh, who is uh, the Chief of Policy and Research at Infrastructure Australia. Peter. Thanks so much for that introduction, Nicholas. And thank you to uh, Bronwyn and the team at National Growth Areas Alliance for inviting me along to speak today. Uh, I just firstly want to start by acknowledging that I'm on Ngunnawal land uh, and I want to pay my respect to elders past and present and of course emerging and any other Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islanders on this call today. Um, I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork for those that don't know IA. We are the Australian Government's Infrastructure Advisor. We sit within the Australian Government. However, we have an independent board. We advise governments of all levels, industry, and of course, the community on infrastructure matters, both investment and reform. In approaching this discussion today, there are a couple of questions that were laid out for me that I thought were a fascinating way to start a discussion. So what's my least and most favourite Australian suburbs and what makes them so good and poor? or poor, and uh, what are some of the challenges? And I just really wanted to test that hypothesis a little bit right at the outset by not just talking about suburbs, but talking about places in a much larger sense. And I really wanna emphasize this notion of place, which is core to the way we work at Infrastructure Australia. In fact, uh, for those that haven't seen our recently released 2021 Australian Infrastructure Plan, I encourage you to review the 600 pages or so of fun that's in there, but we do reflect very closely on place and, and the challenges that are emerging across our growing suburbs in our peri-urban or peripheral centralities, as well as in some of our smaller cities and regional centres. And I thought this image of Brisbane was a great way to start the conversation. Some very inner Brisbane suburbs uh, in fact, at the time that this map was produced, that were very outer Brisbane, Brisbane suburbs, which I think is a wonderful, fascinating story of our cities and the way that they evolve and shift and change over time. And indeed, here is some architecture from the suburbs of some of my favourite Australian cities. And this is a little bit of an interactive quiz. Um, so I love a bit of interaction in a presentation. Um, and just let me take a brief moment to allow each of you, and we'll start uh, on the top left of the first row, and perhaps move across that row before moving to number four on the uh, second row on the left and go across. And I encourage you, if you're brave and bold, to suggest which Australian cities this architecture could be characteristic of. And I think that number two is perhaps the most challenging, but for those that have heard me present before, it's my hometown, so perhaps a little encouragement there. But we can see in this suburban architecture 
uh, something that characterizes these cities of Australia. I feel that it defines not only the place, but the identity of the people that reside there. And indeed provides a platform for uh, the attraction of new residents, for the revitalization of suburbs. And I have to say, I feel that all of these buildings look particularly flash, probably because they were taken from realestate.com. Uh, but I do encourage you just to leave some ideas in the chat and see if you get it right. Because here we see a mix of architecture from Canberra, Wollongong, the steel city miners cottage uh, concept of the weatherboard of fibro cottage that is scattered through places like Geelong and Ulladulla, Wollongong, Newcastle, even right up through the northern rivers of New South Wales. Of course, um, some beautiful, uh, a beautiful Queenslander there at starting the second row and that characteristic brickwork that defines Adelaide. Anyone who's been to Adelaide Airport would have seen that scattered on the way. And what we see just reinforcing in, in these places is is not just architecture, not just a suburb, but indeed an identity, an identity of a place which we feel is critical to thinking about the way the place could evolve and shift over time. And here indeed we see another example. Uh, on the left, a little tongue in cheek, I must admit this image. So this is the somewhat characteristic New South Wales Housing Commission two bedroom fibro cottage. This one, unfortunately, uh, affected by a fire and I, I can't say I, I completely know the story so uh, hopefully everybody uh, left that building well but on the right we see uh, another building a house by the name of the Illawarra Flame which is in fact developed by the University of Wollongong. Uh, it is a uh, low impact home featuring solar uh, indeed it's got a lifted energy efficiency rating. It's capable of growing much of the food that residents would consume on site. Uh, and it is in fact a conversion of that two bedroom fibro cottage. And what we see here is that not only can a type of building characterize a place, but the role that it can play in shaping the suburb and building identity can, can also shift significantly. So you have a significant opportunity in our places, indeed at different scales, whether they be scattered like a housing commission set of tenancies or whether they be concentrated, for instance, in some of those suburbs uh, I mentioned in the earlier slide. But we see an opportunity for identity to be leveraged at scale across places from a single site to building an identity on a street, a neighbourhood, a town, and indeed right through to thinking around a state in the case of the Queenslander. So we've used this concept of identity as a really fundamental feature in thinking about a staged approach to urban development, both in terms of attracting growth in regional centres and indeed in, in terms of a di defining identity of outer peripheral suburbs or peripheral centralities uh, and the role that we can play in attracting people to those communities and indeed attracting jobs. And I'd point to this staged approach, as I mentioned, contained in the plan. But I also just want to identify another critical challenge in the plan that feeds into this conversation, which is the critical role that medium density will play in supporting the growth of Australia's cities. Continuation of urban growth and pushing the boundaries of our cities places pressure on infrastructure provision. Indeed, a certain level of density or critical mass is essential for the provision of the infrastructure that many Australians now take for granted and think is critical for the livability of cities access to public transport, indeed in future opportunities around neighbourhood or suburban electricity storage, access to uh, higher quality broadband and mobile connectivity. So we feel that there's a critical role in supporting medium density housing options. We also feel that there's a critical need to think about some of our infrastructure of past. And here, indeed, we see a power station, the Casula Power Station, for those that know um, this building in Sydney and the opportunity that it has played around repurposing and adaptive reuse in this case for artistic purposes. But indeed the opportunity for a number of buildings, whether it be silos in Launceston, whether it be uh, warehousing development or indeed these infrastructure uses to be adapted and to be applied in a way that either supports medium density accommodation as we see in the larger picture on the right or indeed um, standalone dwellings or, or job attraction as we've seen in Launceston with that beautiful silos development. So I just make 
the point in closing that we see in our architecture, in our places and suburbs, critical identity, identity that has built those communities that is likely to evolve over time, but should be embraced and captured and continued in order to provide a new identity for those communities and attract growth, both in terms of supporting population, but also in terms of supporting economic activity and indeed critical for Infrastructure Australia and our role, providing that critical mass that can ensure infrastructure provision to support livability. On that note, Nicholas, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I've, I, I'll use my privilege, I think, as a as the sort of chair to to get a quick question in there. Um, I, I put it in the chat box, but you know, you had a, a sort of hierarchy of scales there um, and uh, presented the opportunities for creating identity at those different scales. Uh, I just wonder whether the regional scale was a particular challenge in in creating. Uh, buy into community and in place um you know and obviously infrastructure is um pretty important at that scale but it's the regional scale that seemed to me perhaps the most challenging in terms of creating a sense of identity i have to be really upfront nicholas and say i think you've hit the nail on the head to be quite honest you're precisely right in terms of the level of sophistication in our tools and methodologies and approaches to understanding place currently. So we see an evolving practice around neighbourhoods. We see consideration, for instance, in transit-oriented developments and the application around um, railway stops, as an example, that there's the opportunity, a well understood now opportunity for integration of interventions, but on a, on a larger scale, on a neighbourhood or indeed a suburban, and, and as you've rightly pointed out, regional scale, the challenge is much more immense. But it's a challenge that we've seen internationally and also in some applications in Australia, or be them reasonably limited success. So I just want to point to one example, which is the revitalising Newcastle initiative uh, that has been deployed in, in Newcastle in New South Wales. And I point to it as a story of success not because of the individual projects, but because of the role that that project has played in changing the identity of Newcastle CBD. I touched on the fact that I'm from Wollongong, another coal city, um, quite a different story of growth in Wollongong, which has not had the Band-Aid off fast that Newcastle has, uh, but now revitalising Newcastle has through uh, the removal of the rail line, the installation of light rail, the moving of the university campus and some major redevelopments like the new hotel in the council chambers has all provided a new gravity to the centre of that city, a gravity and an identity that will need to be embraced and continued for long-term success. But it does show the opportunity for these at scale redevelopments and identity redefining initiatives. Thanks, Peter. Um, maybe Paul has sent in a question here so we might just have one very quick uh, question and answer on this one um, obviously the issue about infrastructure is always getting it in perhaps ahead of housing development uh, or at least concurrently um, that's a that's a major challenge I mean what, what are the prospects for that going forward uh, again another great question uh, I'd point to the work of DPI in New South Wales around their their picks and gigs, such as they've been over time, uh, and they're thinking around the total infrastructure requirements of a place as being a, an opportunity for us to improve governance and planning. Uh, of course, DPI is still working through those processes themselves, and I can't speak on their behalf, but I would say that they wouldn't declare perfection. Uh, but that journey around better understanding the total needs of place is ongoing. And it's something that Infrastructure Australia has touched on in our Planning Livable Cities report, now about uh, two years old. But the, those notions around se sequencing infrastructure development to be clear about the growth trajectory and understanding scalable, adaptable interventions that can be deployed at appropriate scale for consideration of the maintenance burden up front and then enhanced and expanded over time as population grows. And I'd just say really critically, we need to be more sophisticated about the way we manage the public estate of reservations. So land reservations, both in terms of corridors and particular sites. And again, through the Australian Infrastructure Plan, uh, we've recommended that government pool those assets and manage them centrally to ensure they go to the highest order use, not necessarily the agency who, who might have 
being smart enough to have a site at a particular point in time. You know, if you need a school, there's no, no benefit in having a site set aside for 40 years for a hospital. Thanks, Peter. I think in the interest of, of moving along, we, we probably have to stop it there, but we did say we wouldn't let you off without uh, firing a question or two. So Paul and I have, have, um, have posed a couple of questions there, um, but if others have questions or comments, obviously continue to do so on the, in the chat function. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. I know you've got to, to move on to, to other meetings. Um, so we will move on ourselves. And the next presenter is Chris Shannon who is the Manager of Strategic Planning at Blacktown City Council. So, uh, Chris, I can hand over to you. Thank you, Paul. I'll just start sharing my screen. Let me know if you can, hopefully you can see that. Um, uh, thank you, Nicholas. So, um, yeah, Chris Shannon, Manager of Strategic Planning at Blacktown City Council. Um, hold on. Just... work. Yep, there you go. Um, what I want to talk about today, I won't talk about the my favourite suburb or my worst suburb, because I think that's unfair, because I think there's a bit of context involved in doing that. But what I will talk about is a bit of a comparative analysis of growth in Blacktown from two different eras. So in terms of context, um, Blacktown City is in Western Sydney, the, the largest populated LGA in New South Wales, about the fourth largest in Australia. So it's Population is around 400,000 at the moment, and we're growing um, to nearly 650,000 by the middle of the century. So I want to talk about the 1960s. Um, there's some um, demographic figures I found. Around the 1960s was about 45,000 people moved into the city of Blacktown. And then compare that to you know, the five-year period between 2011 and 2016 is very similar population growth and to see how those suburbs rolled out and some of the lessons and, and some principles about renewal from, from both fronts. Um, I've got some figures there about Blacktown being bigger than Tasmania and ACT and Northern Territory by the middle of the century. So it's quite a growing city, um, but these two areas I thought I'd concentrate on today. So talk about the 60s, you know, an era that was, you know, post-war um, boom, a um, lot of immigration, uh, high birth rates, but it was really the suburbs that rolled out in, particularly in Blacktown, um, where an urban structure was designed around the car, where there was high mobility. So you see suburbs rolled out, um, very low density. This is a gross generalisation, of course, but separation of land uses from residential to, to business retail centres that were, were car orientated, um, which makes challenging for renewal a, a problem in, in low density areas where low centres, either with land fragmentation or large format retailing, uh, makes it challenging with high res low residual land values, which can attract private sector re renewal in those centres. Uh, and investment in public domain can also be challenging. But we also found in some parts of Blacktown, there was high concentrations of public housing where government had invested in um, housing for low skilled workers where, where there was a decentralisation of, of employment, uh, low skilled work to Western Sydney. But those areas are now highly socially disadvantaged and, we, and we've moved from the low skilled workers to so the high, uh, high welfare dependent um, residents in those areas. So I saw, I saw a stat just yesterday uh, where I think the, initially the low skilled workers, were, there was 85% of wages was the, the main income source, where now it's only 7%. So it's really highly disadvantaged areas. And here's a map just to show what we're talking about. The, the map on the right, the red, each red dot is a public housing dwelling. Um, the greater Mount Druid area was an area that was planned in the 60s, um, sprawling suburb, Radburn design principle, where you know, orientated around access by laneways to public spaces. And you can see there in that, that area of circle, there's almost suburbs with uh, over 90% public housing. And it's been that way since the 1960s with no real uh, interventionist approach to deconcentrate or, or fix some of the social problems in those areas. But we see catalytic, catalytic infrastructure as a way of, of um, uh, opportunity, providing opportunity for renewal in those areas. Um, the North-South Rail Link, which is a future rail corridor, runs from Marsden Park to St Mary's and down to the Western Sydney Airport, with stations in the right locations, might provide opportunity for renewal. The town centre of Mount Truitt, um, again, uh, low density, spatially sprawled centre, 
we've done some work to make it more of a compact urban form with high connectivity uh, and attracting private sector investment into those areas. And then moving to today, just to compare that and how our suburbs are laid up today, this is a, a suburb in the ponds in part of Western Sydney in Bucktown, um, more formalised, uh, modified grid structure in an area where there was statutory and strategic planning and layers of that that laid out the suburb. And, and I guess the benefit of hindsight, we were able to look back on uh, past suburbs. Uh, this is one that was really integrated and focused around that central riparian corridor uh, with public spaces and um, lane, uh, cycleways and pedestrian um, walkways with a school and community facility and retail shop or sharing facilities in a more compact urban form around that. So the principle there is about um, in Sydney, we're looking at, uh, well, government's been developed this metropolitan strategy around a vision of th Sydney being a metropolis of three cities, Blacktown City between Central and River City in the Western Parkland City, but one that's based around you know, this 30 minute city concept where we're no longer looking at um, the 1960s lower density sprawl, but more of a compact urban forms with uh, access to, to jobs, education, health facilities and services in the right locations. And touching on what Peter was talking about, there's layers of this, there's the metropolitan planning to, to district planning, and then government introduced legislation to require local government to prepare local plans that align with those metropolitan and district plans. And this is an example of the, the Blacktown LGA structure plan. We, we then break it down to uh, precinct scale and then sort of placemaking scale at, at a CBD context. And a real focus around livability and that mixed density and density is very important in, in, in centres locations uh, to attract um, uh, jobs growth and investment and containment uh, and as we grow we need to focus on the context of the place so western sydney is um, notoriously hot in summer and we need to enable our suburbs and renewal opportunities to to really address those issues and a case example in blacktown in this in the strategic center the the, the council has taken the initiative of, of approaching um, the education sector tertiary education sector um, to look at uh, university campus opportunities. We're seeing uh, our, our students leave the city on a daily basis to travel an hour, an hour and a half to get to university. We're a city of growing to 600,000 people. Why isn't there a university servicing the, where the, the growth is occurring? And we're, we're lucky enough to partner with the Australian Catholic University to build a campus on council land in the middle of the CBD. And now turning our, our attention to a health precinct, which is focused around uh, government's investment in a in a public hospital um, expansion, and we're getting interest for private hospitals and healthcare facilities around around that. So, if I talk about my last two slides, on two principles: one's about a governance structure around renewal, and having uh, coordination of plans and policies and strategies in place, um, understanding the drivers of the place, the economic drivers of the place, uh, understanding that. Renewal can't occur on your own. Council can't run us on its own. Government can't do it on its own. There really needs to be partnerships between councils, agent, government agencies, private sector. We need to bring the community on board. And I really think there needs to be a renewal authority uh, focused in, in outer suburban areas. We see them in uh, other parts of, um, in Sydney in particular, inner city areas, but outer Sydney areas with centres that struggle with um, investment in attracting private sector investment, renewal authorities with powers to consolidate land and, and, and offer to, things to market to um, increase residual land values to attract private sector investment and capture that some of that value uplift to invest in infrastructure. And then to touching on Peter's point, focusing on the place, um, the drivers of the place, form and structure, very important. I think density is very important. It's something that gets lost in the conversation, I think, in the outer suburban areas. Density and the intensity of land use, um, two different concepts. Uh, design outcomes of public spaces and, and our buildings and integrating our land, a built form to the landscape and connectivity and infrastructure are very important. I talked about resilience and sustainability. There's a lot in that, but it's, um, I think that, that the ingredients are there, but we need to have uh, a real um, coordination, coordinated approach and a real attention and focus if, if there's going to be renewal of our suburbs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, 
I think we've got a couple of comments in the chat box. So please, yeah, do do send in uh, others. Um, myself and Paul have put a couple of comments there. Uh, I'll just chip in one little comment, and I thought it was really interesting that the the Radburn um, you know designs so idealised and and celebrated probably in many planning textbooks. You know, when when just on its own is is clearly not enough to mm. uh, to create vibrant. Uh, sustainable um, suburban communities, and it's all the other ingredients. It's the it's the balance of employment uh, in particular, but also the infrastructure, the connectivity. So it's the the whole package which is important, rather than uh, sort of designs on a, on a on a piece of paper. If you like, um, thought that was an interesting thing yes. to to bring in. Absolutely, I agree with that, and that's you know we're focused on. It's really hard in outer suburban areas where the Redburn has been placed with in an area that's highly socially disadvantaged and it's a real challenge to for renew all of those areas okay um i think we'll 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 move on the, the aim was to sort of collect um you know sort of comments and, and and further questions at the end and have a bit of a round table so we had intended to move on fairly quickly to, to the next speaker and i'm conscious i ought to be keeping people to time uh so thanks very much chris again um stay with us and, and hopefully contribute at the end um, so we're going to move on uh, to the next uh, speaker. Uh, we're on to Ross Elliott, who is the director of Suburban Futures. Um, I think the recently renamed Suburban Futures, um, probably familiar to all of you. So I'll hand over to, to Ross. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas, and Paul and Bronwyn. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it very much. Uh, let me just see how we go here. Um, Hopefully you can all see this screen. All good? Um, look, what I wanted to do first, if I could, is just explain that um, the difference uh, with a couple of my hats. The Suburban Futures is a national not-for-profit. Its motives and agenda is very much aligned. I think, Bronwyn, with what your organisation is doing, exploring ways to see a better quality uh, suburban environment and regional um, centres emerge. Uh, it's quite different to the Brisbane City Council Better Suburbs Initiative, which was formally established by the Lord Mayor here a couple of years ago. He's asked me to chair it. Um, I want to be quite clear that anything I say in this presentation does not reflect on Brisbane City Council policy or the Lord Mayor, because I do tend to have a slip of the tongue every now and then. I have to be a little bit careful. Um, I just wanted to start as well with a statement, and it strikes me that for much of the time, those of us who are advocates of suburban growth or development or opportunity are always apologising, uh, in that there, there are some in the community who regard it as, as almost as if it is a condition or a disease and it needs treatment. Um, that's not my view, but it's something that's been around for a long time. Uh, some of these views have found their way into highly praised texts in uh, university and other courses. This is just one example. Um, and of course, what they objected to, it's not hard to disagree. I've been to many conferences where designers or planners have shown this image of Levittown in the US as the, the pariah state of uh, suburban sprawl. All that you'd like to demonize is there on the screen. Um, I think what we forget, however, is what that generation of post-war suburban settlers were escaping. Uh, inner cities back then, whether it was New York or whether it was Sydney, were places of poverty, of crime, of overcrowding and disease. Um, very different to what they are now. Uh, so what they were moving to were, were centres of, that offered upward mobility and clearly uh, improved quality of life. And I think the other thing we forget too is that places like Levittown, uh, it's unfair to judge them on opening day that we really need to think about how these things mature over time. And many of our master plan communities, even today, are assessed based on what they look like uh, in their very early years, forgetting that it takes time for the trees to grow, the schools to be established, the community centres, shopping centres, medical centres and other facilities to be introduced. This is it, Liver Town today. The same slide I showed you before uh, is it's, it's anywhere suburban USA. I find that, that um, there's no shortage of people who struggle, uh, like we do, with this anti-suburban sentiment. I singled out this professor from Stanford only because I loved his analogy that uh, of his students who were preoccupied with the mystical qualities of the inner city, but who said that no one wants to discuss the suburbs 
uh, they see life in suburbia, his students, as a social dead end filled with Republicans. <laughs> I laugh at that every time. Um, we have our own version, of course, uh, probably uh, led by uh, Elizabeth Farrelly, who would be known to many of you in Australia. Her anti-suburban views are fairly well known and I think uh, unfair in my opinion, at least. Um, so on to the two key points you wanted us to touch on, the favourite and least favourite uh, places and what are some of the challenges. My favourite is actually also uh, in Brisbane. Uh, Peter Colacino, thanks for starting with Brisbane. Um, Nunda is a uh, middle ring suburb. I'm talking here about the, the suburban business district, if you like. Nunda on the left in the late 1990s was, was very run down. The traffic was funneled through the main street. Uh, there was no local parking. There was a severe loss of amenity. It had issues with crime, a significant vacancy and so on. And a bypass tunnel that you can see on the right of the picture was built in the very late 90s, early 2000s. It was designed to solve a traffic problem, not to create a suburban renewal opportunity but the suburban renewal opportunity came about as a result of solving the traffic problem. Uh, this is what you see uh, before. Uh, the joke was that the, even the full lease science had been up for so long that uh, they were also heritage listed along with some of the buildings. Um, there was a lot of vacancy, 20% vacancy, few jobs, banks moving out. Years later, as a result of the renewal activity, Nunda has become a place that people aspire to be near. It was once a suburb, uh, only 15 years ago, that people were embarrassed to admit living in. Now it's a place of aspiration and a draw card. Um, what's happened as a result of that 50 million thereabouts dollars in, two, in 2000 terms uh, was that the council uh, invested, the, the state invested 50 million in the bypass, the city council invested nearly 3 million in a suburban centres improvement program, which was about place making, trees, night lighting and so on. Very importantly, they changed the zoning levers, which encouraged private capital uh, to get into the Nunda Village Precinct and $840 million later, uh, you have the new Nunda Village. Now that is a great return on investment. Uh, and it's why I think Nunda is my favourite uh, suburb, because as a village, it shows how successful renewal can be. Vacancy rates down to 2.8%. There's another 1,500 odd workers in the precinct. Chermside could be a favourite, another out of Brisbane suburb, but it's a frustration. Uh, visually, this is it largely today. Uh, this photo would have been taken on a Sunday because typically the road is heavily congested it carries more traffic movements than a nearby major arterial. Um, the Suburban Futures explored opportunities around Nunda, which has been nominated in various state regional plans uh, since the early 2000s or late 90s and in the Brisbane City Town Plan, going back some 30, maybe 40 years as a regional business centre, but no one has done anything about it. In all of that time, it's a disgrace. Uh, there are three uh, hospitals uh, in the precinct already, the significant green open space. There's a Westfield shopping centre. Their main uh, objective is to keep people inside the property boundary, of course. Um, many other assets, uh, but they remain frustrated because of the traffic issue. And we suggested a tunnel to remove the through traffic and then allowing the private capital to come into the area. Very simple proposition. Where would you rather be than the uh, term side before? or the churn site after. Uh, and we look at you know, some of these suburban renewal opportunities. I think it's a great opportunity for public-private partnerships for local, state, federal, and uh, private capital to work together. Uh, a more appealing district is going to attract capital and that will in turn attract workers. And that in turn means opportunities to work closer to where people live rather than consigning them to the long, costly, boring commutes. The design challenges very quickly. I think we're suffering from a problem of preoccupation with the inner city. This is Queensland state budget going back some 10 years, uh, in which time $14 billion has been spent on the fewer than 10% of people who work and live in the inner city, while the highest growth parts of the southeast region, tasked with growth under the state plan, and that's Moreton Bay, South, Brisbane East, Brisbane West, Moreton Bay North, at the right of the screen, 
receive the least amount of funding. It's a, it's a real problem and it flies in the face of the facts. Uh, very quickly, you can see here the inner city of Brisbane is not the major employment centre within uh, the southeast Queensland region, but very interestingly, it's also the slowest growing. So the further away from the city centre, this was in the 2011 to 16 period, the faster the growth. And I've got no reason to believe that's any different when the next census will come out. Uh, the reason for that, I think, is that the industries driving growth have changed. This is from the uh, early 90s through the early 2000s. Uh, the industries that required CBD offices like information, professionals, uh, finance, business, property services were the fastest growing industries back then. The picture has now completely changed. Healthcare and social assistance, education and training and so on are now the industries driving growth and they do not require centralised locations. They require suburban locations for growth. Uh, and the argument I have or the debate I constantly struggle with is getting this point across uh, to people in regional and uh, city planning that even amongst the professional class of workers, 76% are currently in suburban locations, business districts or high streets or major centres, 93% of people in education and 90% of people in the health sector are in suburban or regional locations by their very nature. Finally, I just wanted to end on a little case study of a and outer industrial, former industrial district called Salisbury, uh, typified by sawtooth sheds post-World War II era. That uh, spinning uh, factory on the right was closed in 1995, and that's it as of this year. Nothing has happened in 25 or 26 years because of intransigence over uh, change of use. Uh, the area is still identified zoning-wise as industrial. Its opportunity to grow and change and meet community needs are being frustrated. Uh, we performed some work on Salisbury that explored the history and the possible evolution and future. We imagined uh, some new alternative uses uh, for the precinct uh, and did some initial work, which received a lot of positive support from the community, but sadly, uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. And I think the irony in all of this to end on is these are all images of inner Brisbane where we've splashed the cash like you wouldn't believe over 30 years as part of Better Cities program. The results have been outstanding. Uh, there's no denying it. World class, I think in many respects, but these were all heavy industrial uses in their day. Uh, they have now been converted into any uh, uh, a mix of, of uses and the area has become now home to the wealthiest real estate and the wealthiest people in the entire state of Queensland. I simply ask if it can be done here, why can't the same be done in other centres like Chermside or in Salisbury or many other centres in Brisbane or even elsewhere in the country? The move to create um, better cities celebrates its 30 year anniversary this year and I think that's a timely point to then turn our attention to building better suburbs. Uh, like Nanda, Nicholas and everyone, thank you. Thanks very much, Ross. Um, and uh, some great examples there, I think, of um, some of the challenges, but also the, the opportunities that exist in the, in the outer suburbs. So um, some really good examples. Um, I mean, it just occurred to me, and I'll use my, my chair's um, advantage again, um, you know, who who is best placed? Who or what organisations are best placed to um, convene those sorts of discussions and remove roadblocks or planning blight, as it might be called? Is it is it uh, the state sector, which can come with all of its uh, particular sort of baggage and responsibilities? Is it not for profits like yourselves? Who who are the best organisations and people to sort of uh, not bang heads together, but but bring people together to to remove some of those roadblocks? Well, I think there's no escaping the need for uh, all levels of government to work together. That's what you had with the old Better Cities program. Um, uh, it worked directly uh, with local governments um, with a focus on inner city areas. There's no reason the same thing couldn't happen today with suburban areas. Uh, you can't do it without the support of the state. You can't, and most of the heavy lifting will be done by private capital. If you create the opportunity and the environment, your return on investment is huge. Um, 
we don't seem to be uh, able to manage getting past a simple city deal. Though. So I, I, I'm very frustrated by it all, Nicholas, to be honest. Um, political jealousies and, and rivalries between the different levels of government are not helping any of us. So still work to be done by the sounds of all of that. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Ross. In order to keep the conversation or the presentations rolling along, we'll, we'll we'll move on to the next speaker, but we'll hopefully come back to some of what you've just discussed and, and others as well. So thank you very much. And we'll move on to now to Christian Rooming, uh, who is an associate professor and the discipline chair uh, in geography and planning at M Macquarie University. Uh, Christian. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, just get my screen up. Can everybody see that one? Yep. Um, okay, so so thanks everybody. And um, I've taken a slightly different approach to this presentation, but I think it touches on many of the themes that the previous um, speakers have discussed. Um, but I want to look at three broad types of suburbs, um, each which have a unique built form, geographical location, and indeed challenges in terms of uh, development and regeneration. So riffing off the, the title of the session, I broadly define these suburbs as, as vintage, vulgar uh, and in vogue suburbs, but of course uh, acknowledge that there's huge uh, diversity and these are very broad categorizations. Uh, most of my examples come from Sydney, but they certainly uh, build on themes and processes happening in other cities um, as well. Um, so what are my categories? So first of all, the vintage. So when we look in the dictionary and, and we see vintage is defined as denoting something from the past of high quality, especially something that re represents uh, the best of its kind. Um, for me, this describes a set of suburbs built before the Second World War, typically located in the inner and perhaps middle ring suburbs of our cities. These are the suburbs dominated by Georgian, Victorian, Federation and Edwardian architecture that we saw uh, previously as well. So the suburb which comes to my mind when I think of vintage suburbs is a suburb uh, such as Daisyville. So Daisyville is located seven kilometres uh, south of the Sydney CBD. Construction began in 1912 um, and it was a response to uh, crowding and unhygienic conditions in the inner city. So if you like, it was the first or part of the first wave of suburban expansion uh, in Australia. Um, it's an example of modernist planning ideals based on the idea of the garden suburb movement. It was a self-contained suburb with its own tram lines, schools, shops. Um, it was developed by the state government for dedicated workers' housing, um, and most of the suburb remains in social housing today. Um, Daisyville has been through periods of, of decline and regeneration, um, but today is an example of a vintage suburb reveals two policy challenges for inner suburban regeneration. So the first one's around heritage preservation. Um, so there's a need to ensure that um, these suburbs are maintained and that significant heritage buildings are not demolished uh, in the pursuit of modernization. Um, and the second one, and it's related, uh, centers on the need to ensure sympathetic forms of regeneration, um, to make sure that new developments uh, enhance the character or build on or, or the character of these, these suburbs and these places. Um, and increasing density can be difficult uh, in some of these vintage suburbs, particularly where uh, perhaps there's local community opposition or resistance. So my second category uh, that I want to talk about, uh, I characterise as, as vulgar. Uh, and again, if you look at the definition of vulgar, it means lacking sophistication or good taste. Um, and I certainly don't want to be pejorative here, um, building on the previous point I think that Ross made. Um, but this description uh, represents how some suburbs are viewed by some in the community, some in media, and indeed some uh, planning policy. These sub the suburbs that fall into this category include suburbs built following the Second World War um, and the period of, I guess, the second suburban expansion uh, moving into the middle and outer rings of our suburbs. Um, this is a period that re represents a period of sprawl, of rapid and uncoordinated expansion. Today, many of these suburbs um, are made up of, of housing stock, which is ripe for regeneration. So they're characterised by dwellings of, of weatherboard uh, houses, often on large blocks, 
Uh, in some locations, they're dominated by two or three storey walk-up flats. Um, with poor access to transport, social uh, and community services, and importantly, labour markets, many of these suburbs become the site of locational disadvantage characterised by lower socioeconomic households. Uh, for me, and I'm, I'm certainly not alone here, um, these ageing middle suburbs represent some of the biggest challenges for our cities um, and how they are, are regenerated. So they're, they're a bit of a, um, places of, of ambiguity, if you like. Um, and this ambiguity is no more obvi obvious than when you look at strategic planning policy. So while middle suburbs have the capacity to absorb a greater share of new growth, um, they've largely been neglected in planning policy. Um, the 2014 strategic plan uh, illustrates this with large swathes of middle and outer rings represented in white here, uh, largely ignored. And I know there's a more recent metro strategy which does largely the same thing. Um, the regeneration of middle ring suburbs is incremental, it's uncoordinated, and it's largely outside the purview of strategic planning policy. Uh, and it's left to local government and the private sector. One of the main absences in urban regeneration policy relates to suburban private sector housing renewal occurring outside designated centres. Um, so one example of this type of regeneration might be the knockdown rebuild phenomenon. Um, so knockdown rebuild is certainly not new, um, but its prevalence has uh, expanded in the last decade or so. Uh, and knockdown rebuild offers a set of opportunities, but also challenges. So in terms of opportunities, it can replace degraded stock. Um, it can provide a form of affordable housing, and it does allow homeowners to stay in a community where they have existing attachments. However, there are a series of challenges with this form of renewal as well. Um, it can significantly change the built form of a street or suburb. It does replace existing affordable housing stock and it can cause considerable community opposition. This type of regeneration fails to address the wider issues which might relate to access to transport, employment or other services. It also represents opportunities lost in terms of, issue, of addressing issues such as sustainability, urban design or actually uh, increasing uh, built um, increasing housing stock. There is a need for a more coordinated regeneration of middle ring suburbs. Um, one possible solution has been called greyfield regeneration. Uh, and greyfield regeneration offers a precinct scale regeneration, which offers the potential to increase the quality, quantity and diversity of medium density housing. It is essentially about coordinated regeneration across a suburb. The idea is not new, um, and a number of innovative planning and development projects have been undertaken, particularly in Melbourne. Despite the possibilities of greyfield regeneration, a number of barriers remain, such as issues associated with lot amalgamation, so the need for owners to come together to sell or redevelop their property, issues of economics, which was touched on previously around ensuring that the density is enough uh, to entice the private sector to engage in this form of development. There are also concerns around the capacity of existing planning frameworks to deal with this type of regeneration or development. Um, the capacity to facilitate mixed use, higher uh, density developments and plan for precincts which contain non-contiguous lots, which is a major uh, challenge for, for planning. Um, and there are also issues around funding mechanisms and perhaps new construction techni techniques. It's important to note that some steps have been made to facilitate middle ring regeneration, such as the low rise housing code in New South Wales, uh, which sets design guidelines for dual occupancies uh, and um, multi dwelling houses. Um, nevertheless, several barriers remain for middle ring suburban regeneration, including existing built form, complex patterns of ownership, including issues around strata title, um, complicated and disjointed planning legislation, community expectations, ac access to transport, uh, employment and social and community services. So my final category uh, is what I've called uh, in vogue or the vogue suburbs, defined as popular uh, or fashionable. Um, and these are the contemporary suburbs being built on, the, on our urban fringes, often in designated growth centres uh, or areas. 
Um, so demand for suburban living remains. So a recent study in Brisbane found that suburban residents value this idea of suburban lifestyle, spacious homes and gardens, amenity, housing affordability, and suburban culture and tradition. So the form of development now occurring across our cities uh, represents a departure from the suburban development model rolled out in the post Second World War period. They are far more coordinated, they are master planned, um, and indeed there are parallels to earlier forms of suburban development, such as the Garden City uh, inspired Daisyville, which I discussed earlier. The examples here come from, from the Southwest Growth Centre um, in, in Sydney. I'm not going to talk about these in, in detail because I'm sure there are many people here who are far more um, familiar with these particular developments. However, there are examples of contemporary suburban development that perhaps represent a better form of suburban development compared to that post-war uh, uh, suburban development. Increasingly, new development is adopting many of the planning and design logics of major regeneration projects. Fringe developments tend to draw on design elements of new urbanism, um, where town centres are now seen to deliver infrastructure services and senses of community. Importantly, these suburban developments can, um, can emerge as sites of innovation. Um, so innovations can take the form in the, set, uh, in the form of sort of diverse housing lots or dwelling types, uh, which might address issues of for housing affordability, can provide housing for diverse uh, households, and can address issues of amenity and urban design. They also offer the possibility, uh, assuming funding is available, to provide community infrastructure and services up front rather than waiting years for them to be delivered. And there are also opportunities around um, sustainability technology, such as on-site electricity generation and water recycling and a whole series of other technologies as well. But at the same time, a series of issues remain which must be addressed for new suburban developments to meet their potential. Um, access to transport remains a concern. So yes, many of these new developments, especially in growth centres, do have access to trains or metro stations, um, but this is not the case for, for everyone. Access to employment remains a concern. So despite the idea that new town centres will provide employment opportunities, the size and scope of employment in these centres remains limited. Many will still commute, continue to commute out of the suburbs for work. For work. Um, and of course, there are issues of, of climate change and issues like urban heat islands and access to, to green space, which remain challenges for new suburban development. Um, so I'll finish up there. I think I've tried to quickly run through a, a set of uh, suburbs uh, across our major cities. Um, our suburbs are diverse uh, and urban policy and development needs to acknowledge this diversity um, and respond uh, accordingly. So I'll finish up there. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, uh, Christian. Um, excellent tour. and. Um, we would expect, um, I guess, the first suburban nation to have a, a diversity of suburbs, and that I think is the part of the attraction uh, to the whole seminar series, but also in particular this this particular seminar about policy and uh, and practice. So, uh, a great uh, tour there. Thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, again, I'll probably um, use uh, a bit of uh, chairs license here. Uh, I mean. It's it's interesting what you say about the outer suburbs. Um, in many respects, you know, best practice in, along so many different dimensions now compared to perhaps um, uh, you know, previous vintages of suburbs, which appeared more haphazard, a little bit less coordinated. That word was thrown in there. They're somehow more administered, um, perhaps too planned, as someone has uh, just mentioned, Ross, I think. Uh, they're almost sort of overplanned or perhaps bureaucratically, you know, uh, better practice, and yet there's still a bit of dissatisfaction with some of the outcomes. I don't know if you've got any reflections on that, uh, Christian. Um, look, I think the, the observation that perhaps they're overplanned is, is a good one. You know, I think there's a, a delicate balance between the need for planning and that sort of organic nature of our cities and suburbs to, to evolve. Um, so, I, you know, I think that takes time. You know, I think that was a point made in, in some of the previous presentations. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I guess that's my reflection on, on that sort of point. Well, we might come back to that because I think we've got uh, somebody from the, the Victorian Planning uh, Authority probably to talk about the PSP process, which, for example, is you know part of the way in which um, the outer um, Melbourne suburbs are, are, are planned out and 
there's a bit of discussion, I suppose, around you know um, the need to revise those PSPs. But anyway, um, thanks very much, Christian, uh, for the presentation and the and the reflection there on the on the question. I think we'll uh, we'll move along because I know that time is still ticking and we want a bit of time at the end for a few comments and questions. So. We'll move on um, to Jane Homewood, who is the Executive Director of Statutory Planning Services uh, at uh, DELP, uh, Planning Department of Environment, Water and Land. I think it's gone off the end of my screen. Oh. Hi, Nick. Jane. Can you hear me? Sorry. I yes, Jane, over to you. Yeah. Sorry. Hang on. I. Uh... I can't see you. Just let me know if you can see me and, or you can see my presentation. All good. Good. Um, so um, a number of, so Nick asked me to come and talk today about my PhD, which was on the transformation of inner Melbourne from the late 1960s and mid 1980s. And to look at the lessons learned from that time when Melbourne transformed from a, inner Melbourne transformed from a very, uh, monocultural um, uh, nine to five city with very little mixed use to um, what it became known as as renowned for its livability. Um, there are three topics that have been also raised today um, that it focused on, which is the governance of cities. How do you implement change as we need to retrofit some of our older, less um, livable suburbs, and we plan our new suburbs, and what's the role of public participation in the development and planning of cities. To the next slide. Um, so just to give a uh, quick overview, um, the phenomenon of post-war years to save in a in a Melbourne was a junction between geography, culture and politics. Um, what was amazing about this time is that there was an enormous radical change in the way cities were planned and governed. Um, and a group of citizens became quite highly active in influencing government policies and government structure on how cities were designed and redeveloped. Um, at the time, um, the MMBW, the Housing Commission of Victoria and the Metropolitan Planning Committee were committed to slum clearance and the construction of inner city freeways to accommodate growth and the growth of the private car. Um, the slum clearance program included the redevelopment of 52,000 acres of all the residential zoned land in inner Melbourne. Um, this was a time where um, citizens and civil participation um, emerged and became incredibly strong. It was a time of anti-Vietnam War protests, development moratoriums, campaigns for equal pay, Indigenous rights, and uh, um, as John Kane, our previous Premier, described, it was uh, in response to a very narrow, sexist, sectarian, racist society when a number of voices felt that what was important to them wasn't being addressed by government. Um, there were a couple of our own, Jane Jacobs, Ruth Crow, who, uh, with her husband, Morrie, undertook an enormous um, campaign with inner city residents to really change the way governments approach to the design and development of cities. Um, in 1967, Maury held a trade union living standards convention. And if you look on the screen, a number of the things that were raised then are still really important today and have been raised today the importance of the federal, state and local government providing plans for urban development and redevelopment of suburbs, um, making sure that we put people at the centre of our planning, importantly, the coordination of all the public authorities to ensure there was integrated design, the critical importance of access to public transport and ensuring that all of our development was complemented with great open spaces and that our cities were complemented by um, areas of nature conservation and recreation on the edge of our cities. And also importantly, which is still a challenge of how do we get that mixture of densities and experimental housing um, to meet the needs of our diverse communities. 
Um, interestingly, back in the 70s, Ruth Crow championed for uh, an 18 hour city that could meet all of the daily, her daily needs and that she could participate in social sporting and cultural life, which resonates with the 20 minute neighbourhood work that Melbourne is currently implementing through the Plan Melbourne implementation. Um, Maury Crow, who um, uh, moved into a number of the more conservative town and, plan town and country planning associations, attended a lot of conferences, worked with people like David Yenkin and Andrew McCutcheon, who became a Minister for Planning, looked at what was the appropriate way to govern, govern cities. Um, and I think uh, one of the interesting things he proposed is, yes, the coordination and an important role of the federal government, but that there was this handing up and handing down of power so that there was a grassroots impact and influence by local communities, but that the urban design, the urban renewal plans were really managed by the state government and there was supporting funding by the federal government. Um, so, as I said, he saw the importance of state government um, leading major urban renewal programs. Let's just start, sorry. Um, but importantly, coordinating the myriad of government organisations um, to ensure that we had integrated planning. Um, and that they promoted that it was important that the Urban Renewal Authority had all the skills associated to those matters of town sociologists, economists, planners, design and community representatives. Um, his model had local renewal committees and their role was to ensure that there was satisfactory engagement and community and communication with community members so that they had their input to manage what was important in local areas, but that there was um, a commitment and ability to in fact implement those plans that were so vital for a sustainable city. Um, when Kane got into government and a lot of the ministers that he appointed had been part of the um, radical activists trying to change the way cities were planned, um, Evan Walker became the Minister for Planning and David Yenkin was the Secretary. Um, key parts of what they saw as a reformist government was ensuring that planning schemes to work to, were to encourage desirable and useful development, but the role of government was to intervene in market forces and initiate development of public land and partner with the private sector to initiate development that had a really positive triple bottom line um, outcomes for both city and rural communities. Um, they were committed to uh, demonstration projects such as South Bank, which was redeveloped, uh, and um, a renowned game changer was the greening of Swanson Street to bring all of Melburnians into the city to really show how uh, the city could change from what had been a nine to five domain of office workers into an integrated mixed use domain for people to live, work and be entertained. Um, one of the important, the, I'm sorry, uh, I'm a critical incident controller at the moment, so they're trying to ring me. Um, an important really important plan that was introduced by the city of Melbourne was grids and greenery. Um, this was um, inspired by the first urban design team in Melbourne led by Michael Scott and well known Rob Adams. What was important about um, grids and greenery Uh, what was important about grids and greenery was it not was not an overtly urban design or planning strategy, but what it did for an, the area of inner Melbourne was set out the critical uh, natural and um, built form elements that uh, were critical to the character of inner Melbourne and then that provided the framework to accommodate significant development and growth. 
Um, so how's this relevant to what uh, is being implemented at the moment at the City of Melbourne? You'll see that a number of the features of the 20 minute neighbourhood were those matters that were raised by the Crows and the inner city activists that um, stopped inner Melbourne from being demolished and actually created those areas that are re renowned now. So making sure that we've got neighbourhoods, whether it's in the inner city or the suburbs or the new suburbs, where there are opportunities for lifelong learnings, local playgrounds, green streets, community gardens, sport and recreation, affordable housing, the ability to age in place, walkability uh, and local employment opportunities. Um, the map in front of us here shows those areas in green that have access to um, that 20, those 20 minute neighbourhood qualities and then the areas in pink where we've got a lot of work to retrofit those areas so that we provide those uh, levels of amenity and access to our residents in those fringe areas of um, metropolitan Melbourne. Um, so um, I apologise for those uh, intermittent phone calls um, and Nick, back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Jane. Uh, we've got some um, interesting sort of comments as well in the in the chat box there, I think, um, that, that, that feed into something I could ask and it wondered, you know, what you thought the prospects were for, for leveraging um, greater amount of, you know, public involvement, participation in planning issues in the outer suburbs. You've you mentioned that, you know, very strong in the, in the inner suburbs and in the, in the 60s in particular. And we tend to dismiss or write off, you know, new residents, uh, you know, arriving in the, the outer suburbs as being s somewhat preoccupied with their, you know, getting their head down and, and the regular, you know, daily life. But what what, what prospects or potential is there out in the the outer suburbs for you know in greater involvement of, of people who are effectively part of the city building process? I think um, there's an enormous role, role for local government and I think that the 20 minute neighbourhood and at, which is under fundamentally underpinned by sitting down with your community and working with them to identify uh, what are their local needs and how can they be met. Um, COVID-19 has been a real challenge for um, Victoria, as we know, but what's emerged is that we really need to find new ways of communicating with our communities, um, particularly our multicultural communities, um, because I think we assumed that many of them relied on what we, uh, traditional newspapers and radio, and a lot of the messaging wasn't getting out. Um, but I do see that's the role of local government and I see the 20 minute neighbourhood as a fantastic mechanism to engage people because it's so relevant to the quality of their life. I think there are, there must surely be some opportunities as you, as you say, and um, I I'm, I'm, I'm remember reading about Tapiola, which is a garden um, suburb out in, in Finland actually, and, and how the people who moved out to there were you know, consider themselves pioneers. They bought into something new, a new project, um, uh, and that you know, developers, I suppose, are part of the part of the the issue there because you know, in marketing a place to somebody, you want also to those people to buy into it and to and to be active uh, in in its build out as well, and perhaps even modifying things that developers might have come up with. Yeah, and I mean, Ross made the point that um, governments can't do it on their own. They've got to partner effectively with the development industry um, and uh, uh, make sure that um, we are developing cities, cities and um, suburbs that are retrofitted, um, uh, particularly with the sustainability challenges that we have. We've, we've come to the end of our speaker, so we've, we've got a, a decent amount of time until 12.30 for a bit of um, cross-conversation, uh, either between the speakers themselves uh, to pick up on, on any of the chat comments uh, or for people to, to ask new questions in, in the chat box, or perhaps even um, use the, the question and answer uh, type function. So um, please do um, you know, send in some, some questions. We've got Ross who has raised his hand, I can see, and Chris. So we've already got a couple of um, uh, of, of panelists waiting to ask questions. I can't remember, I can't see who got there first. Uh, I'm just gonna go by my screen, which looks like Ross. 
Um, so Ross, maybe you want to fire away with your, your comment or question? Thanks, um, Nicholas. Just picking up uh, one of the comments uh, Paul raised about political activism, I wonder if what we're also seeing at the moment is a new uh, political geography, uh, which is breaking down the old traditions of what was working class labour and ruling class capital. Uh, you, you can now define uh, politics more by inner urban privilege and middle and outer suburban uh, disadvantage. Uh, I think we saw a bit of that at the last election where many of the inner urban media and political organisations just simply didn't see it coming. Um, and I wonder if that's something that's going to continue to play out. Um, I'm just keen to know what everyone thinks about it and, and also what's been contributing to it and um, if it's a permanent feature going forward. Answers, comments? Can I, can I have a, a go at a response of sorts? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think at a strategic level, it's interesting that when we look at um, political electorates, they become politically valuable, particularly at state and federal level, when they're, um, when they're marginal seats. If you live in a safe seat, then I think there's a sense of political apathy towards those places because there's no interest in them. And turning that on its head in terms of political activism, activism from the local level, uh, where you had, you know, the 1960s, 1970s were about street protesting. Are we moving? I think we're moving into a more kind of stealth political protesting where areas are kind of, you know, could be or should be progressively moving to being marginal spaces. So if people in those kind of middle and outer ring suburbs are to somehow um, collaborate and communicate with one another via Facebook and other social media, you could vote strategically and create yourself. A, turn yourself into a marginal electorate and then have money basically coming forward towards you. Chris, do you want to move on to your comment question? Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. I was just going to respond to, um, touch on some of the things that Jane was sort of talking about, um, the, the responsibility of local government. And I think in my presentation, I talked about the importance of um, you know, local government can't do it on its own. Uh, planning is very, very easy in coming up with a plan, colouring maps, and if the right ingredients aren't there for change, nothing will ever happen. There's so many instances of plans um, designed on paper that never come into fruition. And that's largely because, you know, lack of investment in infrastructure, no funding for local government to, do, to, to invest in the public domain, um, private sector is not interested because land values aren't, uh, aren't high enough to, to get interest in redevelopment. And so you can go down a path of engagement with the community and design all the right outcomes, but if you're doing it on your own, it's, you're, 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 you're not going to su succeed in getting the renewal opportunities um, that you want to succeed. So you, we, there's plenty of examples today been shown around um, renewal authorities. You know, you can talk about in Sydney, you've got um, you know, Green Square and, and Piemont Ultimo and Newcastle, you've got um, Honeysuckle and these renewal authorities were created by government um, in, in inner city areas. They don't even turn their mind to Western Sydney or outer suburban areas at all. Uh, and the, the purview there, the response is we've got a policy and local government's your job now to talk to community. Um, I think there's a lot more than that. I think it's a bit more nuanced and I think there's, if there's serious attention to delivering outcomes in outer suburban areas, then government needs to step up. And I think there needs to, to be authorities established. Landcom's an authority in, in Sydney. It's a government development authority, which has been rolling out suburbs in the past. It's now changed its, its focus. Um, but there's a, there's a space for government in there to, if there's real attention given to renewal of centres where there's jobs growth in outer suburban areas, then renewal authorities in outer suburban areas needs to be um, uh, given some funding and some resources and commitment and buy in and get some delivery outcomes on the ground. Planning is one thing, but delivery is another. And that's why I talked about the governance structure is very important. Yeah. Jane, do you want to? Yeah, I will. Um, I mean, I, I would completely agree with you. It's It, it can't be done by um, government, uh, local oh. government alone. Um, it's, 
you know, in my role as state, I'd say there's also an incredibly important role for the federal government. And we do need, we, I, I know that the work I'm doing in inner Melbourne, in Arden and Fisherman's Bend is the cost to retrofit um, urban renewal suburbs goes way beyond the ability of the market to pay. So we do need further money and um, there's a limited pot. We can't expect local government or state government to take it all up. We really need a tripartite funding model, as you say, that doesn't just focus on the inner areas where you have those um, greater property rises where you can, you know, it's, you've got a greater chance, but actually around that infrastructure in the new suburbs. And importantly, as you're saying, the cost to retrofit existing suburbs is significant and we still have challenges with communities accepting greater levels of density to be able to fund um, that level of infrastructure and and what interests me and I don't have the answer but in the um, in the work that I did in my PhD the level of involvement between community groups government, academics, they worked together, they developed policies together, and there was a real hierarchy of where they got delivered, whether it was at a federal, state and local level. And the local level was really just um, almost, um, you know, fine tuning the urban renewal programs developed by the state, um, rather than local government taking it on themselves. I think we've got Ross uh, and then Bronwyn. Um, I, I didn't, but thanks. I will take it up, Nicholas. Uh, I, a couple of you then just raised an interesting um, conundrum, I think, and I'd be interested what the story is elsewhere. Um, I know you've got Stuart Mosey coming on later, and I'll be really interested to hear what Stuart has to say. He's a clever, clever bloke. But it strikes me that in Queensland, at least, we are planning, most of the emphasis in planning is around population and housing. Um, where people live. There is very little work done on where they will work or the types of jobs they'll be engaged in. And there's little thinking done about where those jobs are going to be. The presumption is that the outer suburban growth areas will be dormitories and the inner urban areas will be employment centres. And it flies completely in the face of the evidence, as I see it, at least. Um, and I think overcoming one of those prejudices or some of those prejudices might be the key to unleashing um, a better quality of public policy support, but also more infrastructure dollars for the sort of things that Jane and, and, and Chris were talking about. I just wonder if that's the same elsewhere in the country, if we stuck with that view of the suburbs as being dormitories um, and not as places for people to work, live, play and so on. Bronwyn, did you want to, we, we can sort of hold that thought and we can get Jane and others to come in. Bronwyn, do you want to come in? I, I suppose, yeah, just to, to ex extend on, on that point that um, all of the, I mean, I agree with so much of what everyone is saying, but how, how do we do, how do we actually make this happen and not in the vacuum of talking about best practice? And you look at the current situation um, through the pandemic, we had a, economic downturn, stimulus package came through to uh, stimulate residential construction sector. And so in outer suburban areas, we've seen an enormous increase in development applications and building approvals. It's rushed, it's quick, you know, things that were planned to take place in 10, 15 years time are now slated to take place in the next five years. So how do you balance all of that up to get all levels of government and, and industry at the, working at the same pace? Jane, did you have your hand up or is that? Uh, um, I was going to comment on um, Ross's point. Um, it, it is a real challenge getting um, works into the suburbs. We've recently completed the industrial and commercial land use strategy. Um, it's hard work fighting for um, uh, developers that do want to develop industry in the green, our green wedges, because of course it's a cost thing. However, um, yes, we, we recognize that this is one of our biggest challenges. So the industrial land use strategy protects that land. 
um, so that it isn't um, impacted by growth, recognising that we really need people to be able to work a lot more locally. Um, there are good signs with the pandemic, particularly around congestion, that there will be, a, um, it looks like that we're going to have a more flexible working arrangement. But Ross, I think that's one of our biggest channels in having a sustainable city is getting those local jobs out to those new suburban areas. Chris, I think you've got your hand yeah, up. I, I would agree with that. And I think I think to answer sort of Bronwyn's question, I think we need to understand the economic drivers of each place and um, what the, and having our, you know, Western Sydney, for example, such a broad geographic area, and there's differences in economy right across Western Sydney, it shouldn't be considered as one universal uh, area. So the example I provided in Blacktown was around a health and education focus because we had the hospital and we had a university uh, pressure to wanting to come into to Western Sydney. And we, we, we worked with the private sector to deliver that. And that's going to provide jobs, um, not only job numbers, but uh, different types of jobs that we, which weren't in existence in, in Western Sydney and parts of Blacktown. And there's other areas of other local government areas which have their own uh, economic drivers. And I think we need to focus on those. Population driven jobs are always going to be there as, as growth occurs, but it's always going to be lagging uh, those retail jobs and those local service industry jobs as centres get developed. It's always, as Bronwyn was saying, that housing growth gets rolled out and then these centres start to evolve over time. But they're only going to evolve if there's a critical mass of people around a centre. And I think, I think those, those compact city discussions around centres being more mixed use and higher density, not necessarily higher scale, but you can have density without scale and get a critical mass that's going to attract people to those centres. And investment in public, the public domain, it's, it's really, it's really um, making those places attractive for, for investment. I mean, we might be back to um, the infrastructure question again. There's a, there's a sort of a question here from, uh, from Bob Webb as well, saying, you know, the, um, the Greater Sydney um, model with three, uh, you know, centres, is that a model for elsewhere? I mean, I, I'm not sufficiently been in Australia long enough to comment elsewhere, but, you know, Melbourne is incredibly monocentric. It has a relatively poor public transport infrastructure, which is purely radial. Um, and, you know, if, if you want outer suburban uh, centres of, of any scale, you've got to be able to get to them in, in quicker than 45 minutes. So, Traveling out to do interviews in Casey, you know, forty-five minutes to get out to, to Dandenong, which has been touted as a an outer suburban centre. The equivalent in London would be Croydon or somewhere like that, and it takes fifteen minutes, even with uh, creaking British uh, rail infrastructure. So, you know, and probably even that opportunity of gaining things like back office functions has now been and gone. You know, for a place like uh, Dandenong, so high speed connections are, are, are pretty critical on the public transport front by the time you're building you know 40 or 50 kilometers out of town but um wonder what people thought about you know the sort of the metropolitan scale governance you know i mean it's, it's kind of perhaps missing in the victorian uh, context you know you've got the state and then local governments uh sydney's got that intermediate um sort of arrangement what, what do people think about that Well, Nicholas, it's interesting from a Brisbane point of view, we are the largest local government authority in Australia with, I think, uh, about 1.4 million uh, residents within the city. Uh, I feel often for our Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, when they get one of their Council of Capital City Lord Mayor meetings together, and he's sitting at the table with a, uh, uh, the, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, uh, Clover Moore, she could practically walk around um, the electorate of Sydney in a day. And she probably knows the voters by name. Uh, and it's not, not a lot different, perhaps, to Sally Cap. Um, the, the tragedy, I think, is that the thinking about what is a city becomes conflated with the CBD, which is those jurisdictions in almost every other case other than Brisbane. And uh, in a local government sense, middle and outer uh, suburban areas or regional ones uh, have a have, do not have the same uh, voice as, say, a capital city Lord Mayor. And if that capital city Lord Mayor is expressing public policy concerns on the path of greater Melbourne, but really only interested in inner city uh, electorate, then we, we get ourselves all crossed up. I think it's a, it's a problem. I think we're um, nearly uh, at, the, at the close of um, the session, um, but are there any final 
comments, burning questions that people would like to to make before we make a close. I hand back to Bronwyn and shortly. Okay. I think, Bronwyn, I'll hand back to you so we can close this particular session. We'll obviously be back in the afternoon uh, here in, in uh, Victoria, at least. Great. Thanks, Nick. And um, thanks to all our speakers today, to Peter, Ross, Chris, Christian and Jane. And um, thanks to you all for watching in. The recording of this session will be made available. So we'll contact you in the next couple of days and alert you to where that will be available. There was so much in there that I think I need to unpack and, and take forward as well. So don't forget, we are back in an hour and a half's time for best practices in, in suburban development. And it's been a great uh, conversation. I've learned a lot and I hope um, we can keep this conversation going. So thanks very much and see you in 90 minutes. Thanks, Bronwyn. Thanks, everyone.